Wonderful. Well, I'm excited to be uh, bringing the word here tonight, opening night of C3 Australia Conference 23. And I just want to, want to preach to you tonight about the vision we have for C3 Australia. And when I close my eyes and think about the future of C3 Australia, all I see is life-giving churches within reach of every Australian. Life-giving churches within reach of every Australian. I've got, I've got a map of Australia on my wall in my office. Big map. All the towns all over Australia have got red dots everywhere we've got a church. Tell you what, Australia's a pretty big country. There's a lot of places where there needs to be a red dot. I've got a whole box of red dots ready to stick. You know, you know what else I use that map for? I use that map to plan our trip, our half lap that we did last year. Many of you would know we, uh, quarter four of last year, term four, we pulled the kids out of school, took some long service leave, went for three months, became just like the full bogan camper trailer, camp on the beach, do the half lap of Australia, kids, you know, running around, not wearing shoes, that whole thing. It was awesome. You got to do it. You should do it. But one of the things that we found wherever we went, we love Australia. Australia is an incredible country. We drove across to Broome from Darwin all the way down the Western Australia coast. Probably for you it's that way, isn't it? That way. Across the Nullarbor, straight back up the middle. Took 13 weeks, drove 15,000 Ks. You don't want to know how much money we spent on fuel. It's like everywhere we went it was getting more and more expensive. It was an unbelievable trip. I think we had a photo. Did we have a photo of one, one photo? Okay. There we are. That's... That's us. That's the iconic, iconic trip photo. And uh, I tell you, we love Australia. But even more than that, we love Australians. We love Australians whose ancestors have been here for thousands of generations. This is we're singing that blessing song, thousands of generations. And we love Australians who arrived last week. We've literally, they, one of the places they come is Darwin, like every week. Just moved to Australia. Welcome. You're Australian now. We love Australians. Doesn't matter where they come from, where they've been, what their history. You know, one of the things that we found wherever, wherever we go is that I believe that the woman at the well who Jesus met is symbolic of so many people. Now, sure, their story might be different. They might not be on their, necessarily on their seventh marriage or anything like that. But these people have a story. These people have brokenness. These people have got a, a thirst that they can't quench, no matter what they try, where they go. And I want us to, to start off in that verse tonight because I believe that what, God's, what Jesus speaks to her is something that he wants to speak to, to Australia. John 4 verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water, the water out of the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Have you ever experienced the feeling of the Holy Spirit in your life where it kind of felt like that? The first time I experienced it, I was 17 years old at an Anglican youth camp and the, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, kind of like what we saw at the Asbury thing recently. It just reminded me of what happened when I was 17 years old at this little Anglican youth camp on the north coast, Scott's Head of New South Wales. And we were just there getting filled with the Holy Spirit and weeping and repenting and these, some of these kids prophesying and didn't even know what that was. I ended up casting a demon out of someone. I didn't even know what that was. It was just the Spirit of God was just filling everybody. But I had an encounter where I felt the Spirit of God. I felt like water was being poured into me at the time. And I didn't know this verse, but that was what it was like. Water, living water that Jesus is talking about. Drinking the water of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, that this water that we drink from him 
becomes a spring. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about a spring. You read that verse, it says a spring of water. Think about a pool or something like that. I never really, never made a lot of sense to me until when I, we moved to the Northern Territory, we started visiting some of the natural springs, which we're known for. And there's this one spring in particular, it's called Bitter Springs. So I don't know if anyone's been there in a place called Mataranka. And this place is just an exquisite, beautiful place. And people go there to get their hero shot, kind of like that shot. They get that shot of, at Mataranka Bitter Springs. This crystal clear water. It's 34 degrees temperature every day of the year. So when you wake up in the morning camping there and it's six degrees, straight into the 34 hot tub, what you do is you, you jump in there, we get a pool noodle, and you just float down. Let's just go for a float. And then you hop out, you walk around, and all, you can do that all day. <laughs> this thing has a flow because it's a spring. There's no tide. There's no, it's, it's a spring. Do you know what, what a spring is? What def, defines a spring is that it is continually flowing and self-replenishing. A spring, continually flowing and self-replenishing. So it's always running and it never runs out. This is what a spring actually is. And so out of the ground, this water comes and then it just runs away. Always flowing, never running out. This is what Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is like for us. You don't just get filled once by the Holy Spirit. You don't get, you're not like a bottle of spring water that gets the spring water pulled into it. No, the spring actually gets in the bottle and it's always flowing. Now Jesus, I'm inclined to think that he's telling the truth when he says that. And that kind of like puts a whole new spin on a whole lot of things like, There is a spring on the inside of us, the Holy Spirit, that is always flowing. I think sometimes people can put a bung in it or people turn the tap off. You know there's things that you can do in your life that do that. But you don't have to make the water flow again. You just got to pull the bung out, turn the tap back on, come back to the Lord, repent, do whatever it is you need to do, correct your behaviour, let Let it flow again. Let it flow. So this is what's happening in the individual. Jesus then builds on it in John chapter 7. If we can turn there, 737, it says this, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now, a couple of things I want to say about this. The first one says on the last and greatest day of the festival. What was the festival? It was the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was when they would remember when they wandered round in the wilderness for 40 years, where they would just, the manna would fall from heaven and they would remember when Moses struck the rock and water would flow out, enough water. It's like Moses struck the rock, and, but there was a spring in behind the rock that no one knew about, and it just flowed, always flowing, and never run, in, run out. And so the cool thing is, at this festival, for seven days they had this ceremony where the priests would get this golden jug, and they would go down to the pool of Siloam, and they'd draw out water from it, and then there would be a procession all the way back to the temple, where they would pour it out on the ground as a drink offering to thank God and to worship Him for His provision in the wilderness of the water. And when I read this, I'm like, Jesus is sitting there for seven days, watching them draw water out, big procession, pour it all out. They're remembering a miracle where everybody got to drink and they're doing it in a way that nobody gets to drink. And on the last day of it, Jesus put up with it all week. He says, all right, if anyone's thirsty, he says he stands, he cries out in a loud voice. He's there watching. 
No one's getting a drink anymore because from this religious ceremony that's remembering something where everybody got a drink. But if anyone wants a drink, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. I'll give you a drink. And whoever leaves in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. He adds on to this first thing that he says to the lady at the pool where he says, I'll give you the water that will just well up to you for, to eternal life. But he says, no, no, now it's not just for you. It's going to flow out of you. It's actually for everybody else now. So yeah, the water's for you, but now the water is to flow out to everybody else. One more thing I want to say before we move on from this Scripture. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said. And whenever you read that, you're like, oh, what Scripture was that? Well, people have been trying to figure that out for a long time because there's no Scripture that actually says rivers of living water flow out of a person. And so there's a lot of bit of debate out there, depending on who you read, what they say. Well, what Scripture was it? There is a Scripture that talks about rivers of living water flowing out from a temple. And if you're a Christian, you'll know that Paul says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Not just our body, but together as God's people gather together, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so that Scripture is Ezekiel chapter 47, which I believe is actually a symbolic vision that Ezekiel had of the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And Ezekiel is prophesying the effect that a river that flows out of the temple, it's the temple's the church, there's a river that flows out of the church that has repercussions for the whole world. It's not a judgmental river that's flowing out. It's not a river of condemnation. It's a life-giving river. It's a transforming presence in a lost and broken world. And so if you're not familiar with Ezekiel 47, we'll turn there in a moment, but in a nutshell, you've got a river that flows out of the temple and the further that this thing goes, the deeper the water gets. And then when you get way out there, some pretty cool things happen. I believe that this is what God wants to do through His church. So I've got three things that are basically talking about what it means to be a life-giving church. We're going to find them in Ezekiel 47. Let's read the first couple of verses. Ezekiel 47, verse 1 and 2. It says, the man, we could, I mean, we could even, you could go there and try and figure out who the man is, but trust me, I think Pat Ancliffe's done a great story on Christ in the Old Testament. I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus turns up a few different places in the Old Testament. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Jesus, but there's no way of telling. But, I mean, who better than Jesus to give a tour of his own church, (laughs) right? The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar, He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east and the water was trickling from the south side. Everyone say trickling. Trickling. Isn't that a great word? (laughs) Trickling. It even sounds like water trickling, doesn't it? Trickling. Is that onomatopoeia? Is that that the word? (laughs) Trickling. Okay. My first point about a life-giving church, what it means to be a life-giving church. Life-giving churches are built on the spring. If we go back to this verse, Ezekiel 47, it says, he said, I saw water coming out from under the threshold. It wasn't over the threshold. The threshold's the floor that you're standing on, the doorway. It's coming up from under the threshold. This temple has actually been built on a natural spring in this vision. If you think that sounds far-fetched, it's actually quite common in the ancient world for them to build temples on springs. The ancient Romans, the ancient Chinese and the ancient Greeks all built temples on or right next to natural springs because of the symbolic nature of just water just flowing out of the ground. It doesn't matter what the weather is, 
This water is always flowing and it never runs out. In fact, in the New Testament world, there's a couple of popular temples. The temple to Apollo in Corinth is built on a natural spring. The temple to Artemis in Ephesus is built on a natural spring. And so when we see this temple of Jesus built on a natural spring, we can see Jesus, remember, is the life-giving spirit. The life-giving church is built on Jesus Christ, the life-giving spirit. Now, it's great that we build our church on Jesus Christ, the solid rock, which is awesome, but this solid rock actually has water coming out of it, a life-giving spirit. It is not a dead, it is not a stagnant, it is not ancient, it is alive and moving today. So a life-giving church is built on the spring. It gets crazier. Jesus, remember Jesus said, I am the true vine. He says that, right? Elsewhere in John. I am the true vine. That means that every other vine is kind of a copy of the true vine. Because remember, Jesus is pre-existent. The Jesus is of the vine, the true vine. So God thought, you know what I'll do? Is I'll plant, when I create the world, I'll put vines in the ground as a pointer towards what, what, who Jesus is. So Jesus didn't say, well, kind of see those vines? I'm like that. It's the other way around. The vines are like Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? Jesus is the true spring. When God created the earth, he put springs. In fact, when he created the earth, that was the only watering system. There was no rain. It said water came out from under the ground. That was God's original plan for creation. The rain only happened after sin entered the world. Jesus Christ is the life giving. No wonder all around the world people flock to these natural springs. They build temples around them. Why? Because it is a copy, but it is pointing to the true spring, which is Jesus Christ, the life giving spirit. So the spring is the true spring. Because when you drink its water, you never thirst again. Every other spring, you drink the water, you'll be thirsty again. Jesus is the true spring that when you drink of his water, you never thirst again. Life-giving churches are built upon this spring. This means that the Spirit is active. The Holy Spirit is moving in our churches. It means that fresh moves of the Holy Spirit are just trickling. Remember that word? Trickling. You know, some of us, we want, it's, I mean, it's awesome what we want. We want this overhead river of God in our service every Sunday. Guess what? In the temple, it's just a trickle. I, I believe that God's plan is that what he does here in this place, this is a trickle. It's meant to become a flood out there, not in here. The numbers don't stack up. If Australia is going to be reached with the life, the life and the love of, of, of Jesus Christ, there's not enough churches to hold the people to come in. It has to happen out there. But there's a trickle that happens here because his temple is built upon the move of the Holy Spirit, upon the life and the love of God. And there is life that is moving outwards. We're moving out of this place. God is moving, but it's just a trickle. If you want, if you want more and more and more, you're going to find it out there. Life-giving churches are built on the spring. You know, there's other things you can build churches on. You can build them on traditions. You can build them on causes. You can build them on certain doctrines. You can, you know, that's the wrong block of land to be building a church. You're better off building a church on the spring. In fact, I heard this story about an American couple, only in America. You've got to love the Americans. They give us so much, like, so many jokes, so many stories, so much great material. They... His couple was from Missouri, it's kind of like in the middle-ish of America. And the American dream, you know, for, for them, sorry if you're American, I don't mean to poke fun at you, but these people, they decided they wanted to retire in Florida. Doesn't everybody? And so they worked their whole life, they bought a block of land in Florida, sight unseen, engaged a, engaged a builder, build them their dream house, handed up, they built this million dollar house on this block of land. It was exquisite. But when they turned up to take possession of it, they found out that 
their block of land was actually next door. The survey was done wrong and the house was built on the wrong block of land. The neighbour wouldn't sell them the land, so they had to knock the house down and rebuild it again next door. True story. So many people do that with their life. They build the most amazing house. They build the most amazing life. They build it on the wrong place. You've got to build your house upon the spring, the life-giving. Imagine building a church your whole life, but not building it on the spring, the life and the love of Jesus Christ, active, alive, moving in our midst. Let's read on. As the man, verse 3, went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits, led me through water that was knee deep, up to the waist, another thousand. Then it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. The New King James says, it was water in which one must swim. Water in which one must swim. My second point is this, life-giving churches are swimming. Life-giving churches are swimming. We're not just playing it safe. Here at home in the temple, enjoying the trickle, We know that the further we go with this life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ, the further we go into our communities, the further we go into our schools, out into the universities, out into the sporting clubs, out where the people are, we're going to experience that this water is so deep. I remember the story of David Bennett. Many of you would know David Bennett. uh, He he got saved through a a C3. He's, uh, He's actually my second cousin, believe it or not. And so... We, he, he was a 19-year-old gay activist in, the, in Darlinghurst and, and he was just felt completely rejected by church and by God and there was a, a young woman in his university who met him for a drink at a gay bar in Darlinghurst in, where the, the home of the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras is in Sydney, met him for a drink and while she was meeting with him, she says, have you ever experienced the love of God? And he's like, no. You read about it in his book. It's called War of Loves. And he describes in detail this experience with the Holy Spirit getting filled with this living water that completely transformed his life. I saw in his social media, in a couple of weeks' time, he's preaching in Westminster Abbey. That is incredible transformation. And that happened because this young woman, she was out there in deep water. She was out there in a gay bar in Darlinghurst witnessing the love of Jesus. Kind of makes you think, where would Jesus be? (laughs) Jesus kind of hung out that sort of crowd, didn't he? Back in the day. That's where the deep water is, where you, man, out over my head. Now, obviously, we're not going into places with which for you would be a place of temptation. But we're going into places that we're not necessarily comfortable, but that's where the people are. And we're on mission. You know, the Great Commission is to go. We are going out where the water is deep. That's what God's called us to do. That's where the people are. It's going to cause us to take steps of faith. It's going to cause us to take risks. It's going to make you uncomfortable. We, we had a a thing on our trip, we got, I was, I've never been more uncomfortable and freaked out and excited at the same time. We, we started our trip driving around with a handheld UHF just to, you know, communicate with trucks and other people. It was hopeless. Got halfway, I'm like, I'm going to get a proper one. You know, the big aerials on the front of the, on the, front of the car. Right, yeah, got it. The first day we got it, we went to drive to the next town pulled up behind this on the highway, only an hour into our drive. We've got to drive five or six hours, got stuck behind this massive mining truck on the back of a truck. It's the biggest legal thing that could be on, on the road. And it's going about 70 k's an hour. And oh, this is going to be a long day. And this thing's taken up three quarters of the, both lanes. So not just one lane, three quarters of the entire road. But there's a pilot car behind it. 
and there's a pilot car out in front. And so I've come up behind it and I'm like, okay, I'll call and see if we can get through. But before I, before I kind of figured out how I was going to do it, what I was going to say, how we were going to figure out because there's not enough road, how's this going to work, another road train starts coming up behind me and he doesn't want to slow down at all. And so he calls up and he's like straight on the radio. He's like, road train coming northbound, blah, blah, blah. And he says, the guy says, oh, hold on, hold on. Nah, we're not going to be able to let you through. I've got to let this caravan through first. And I thought, oh, there's my opportunity. And I said, yeah, mate, I'm here. I'm, I can hear, what, hear you. Just call me through when, when I'm ready. He's like, yep, just trying to sort it out for you. Anyway, all of a sudden the road got very windy. <laughs> Double lines. You can't see anything. Can't see 100 metres in front. There's another corner. And you hear the pilot car out the front on the radio. He says, got a little bit of clear, clear road now. And the guy's like, all right, mate, get into it. And I'm like, I'm getting into it. And so I come out on the wrong side of the road, cannot see around the corner. And all of a sudden it starts going downhill a bit. This big heavy truck, he's got all his speed. And so I'm really having to accelerate and I'm, I'm not really gaining on it. And I'm driving kind of right over with one wheel off the road. I can't, I can't go too fast because I'll lose control. It is hectic. Megan is sitting next to me. She's like, what are you doing? Get back across. This is dangerous. You're going to get us killed. Because there's something about driving on the wrong side of the road at speed when you can't see. If you, in my mind, I can see a car or a truck coming around the corner. It's like, it's all over. We're going to wet wiped out. Everything in your life, if, in your mind, is just, this is a bad idea. My wife's screaming at me, it's a bad idea. The kids are freaked out, what the heck is going on? And so I, I, I went, went for it as hard as I could, pedaled to the metal once we, I realised I started getting scared. I was like, got to get in there. Anyway, as I'm getting past the guy, I hear the voice, we've got some traffic now. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> it's like, like, do I have time to... Do, I can't go back because I'm like level, level with him now. Like he's, so I just gunned it. You're just praying. You get in and you get in. And it's like a few seconds later, then cars start coming. It's like, oh, my gosh. We almost became a statistic. <laughs> but you know what? The voice of the pilot called me through and said, go, get into it. And that's what I said to Megan. I said, he's called me through. She's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, he's called me through. We've got to go. I'm going to trust him. The voice of the pilot will call you to places. You've got to step out and trust the voice of the pilot. You might be scared. You might be freaked out. You think you're going to die. But I'm telling you, if you've heard the voice, you've heard the voice of the pilot, maybe this isn't working. I think all the women are kind of like, you're crazy. I tell you what, some of you though, you're going to get an upgrade to your UHF this week. You've got to hear the voice of the pilot. He's going to call you. Steps of faith. You're going to step out. Because that's where the deep water is. I'm telling you, we were in the deep water. And I was loving it. It's awesome. Life-giving churches are swimming. We're out there in the community where the water's deep. Musicians can come. I'm going to wrap up soon. At the point of the most effectiveness in bringing the life and love of Jesus into the world, the water is the deepest. There's things, there's things that God has, ideas, outlandish ideas maybe, that God has put in your heart and in your mind. Step out if God's called you to do it. Ministry ideas of where you could reach people, where you could go, a program, an initiative. If the breath of God is on it, I tell you, the water will be deep there. It means walking by faith and taking risks, finding yourself out of your depth. All right, let's read on as I wrap up my third point. Ezekiel 47 verse 6, he asked me, son of man, do you see this? What a question. Do you see this? Do you see what I'm showing you? The man says to Ezekiel, Can you see? There is an unprecedented move of God planned for this planet. It will start as a trickle 
in our churches. But we need to move beyond our churches into the deep water of the world because this is what happens. He shows him what happens when the water gets out there into the world. It says, He led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Where the river flows, everything. We've got to take the river out. Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Eniglaim. It's like from one end of the Dead Sea to the other. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean. But the swamps and marshes will, will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. My third point about life-giving churches is life-giving churches bring healing to the world. Every place the water touches comes alive. And I don't know if you noticed, but the place that it said that the river flowed into was the Dead Sea. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dead Sea. I don't know if you know anything about the Dead Sea. It's called the Dead Sea because everything's dead. It's a place that's incapable of sustaining life. I think God's trying to make a point. You know, geographically, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. It's minus 430 metres elevation, 400 metres below sea level. It's the site where Sodom and Gomorrah once stood, along the Dead Sea. It's like the judgment of God turned that whole place into a wasteland. But that's not God's end plan. God's plan is to bring life and for His river of life to places that we've left for dead, places that we've judged, places that we've written off as never, places that we've made our enemy. People we've made our enemy. People we've written off. God's plan is that the river flows from the church exactly to those places. Everywhere the river goes, it brings life. It's God's plan for His church. It's His call on us. We're built on the spring, we're established in the house, but we've got to go beyond it. We've got to take the life and the love of Jesus. There's something about the river, it's it's wanting to flow. It's always flowing. It never runs out. If you want to be part of this future that God has prophesied and showed us, of transforming this world, taking the most dead places, the most broken places, the most broken lives and dead lives and bringing them back to life with the love of God. We just stand to your feet tonight. If you wanna be part of this, you want your church to be part of this. We're moving from a build it and they will come to a build it and then go. By all means, build it. There's a temple and it's built on the spring. But don't just stay there. Get out there. Lift your hands one more time. Close your eyes. Lift your voice to heaven. Call upon the Lord here tonight. Jesus, You are the life-giving Spirit. Do whatever you need to do to pull the plug out if there's a plug in your spirit. Might need to 
pray a prayer of repentance. You might need to make restitution with somebody. Jesus, the life-giving Spirit of God, we want to be Your representatives. We want to be life-giving churches. Move through us. Let the rivers of living water trickle out from this place. Move in our churches. Move in our communities. Reach the people of Australia. People who would never walk into churches. Let's take the river to them. God, we don't make it happen. We just let it happen. Give us the spirit of faith to take the bold steps you're calling us to take. I see churches starting in all kinds of strange places that you'd never think of starting a church before. We've seen glimpses of it before, churches starting in pubs. I tell you, that's not an anomaly. That's going to become the norm. Pubs with churches starting. I've heard of people starting churches in parks. Start churches in parks and start churches wherever the people are going to be. Father, we thank You. Your Spirit is upon us. We thank You, Lord God. Hundreds of churches being birthed all across Australia. Life-giving churches. God, no matter what tribe, no matter what family, we declare life-giving churches. God, bless every church that is life-giving. Multiply every church that is life-giving that the Name of Jesus would be glorified. God, that a great harvest, a great harvest would be made in Australia, a great harvest of souls. Father, we thank You. God, we stand shoulder to shoulder with one another, reaping the harvest, bringing people to Jesus. Father, we thank You. You've called us to be life-giving churches. Let us be life-giving people for the glory of Your Name. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank Him.